We've had such an interesting and important day, and I'm so sad. I'm so glad that we can end it um, with this keynote address by uh, Professor Stephen Haggard. Stephen Haggard is the Krauss Distinguished Professor at the School of Global Policy and Strategy, which I used to know as the um, School of International Relations and Pacific Studies, but it, it has changed its name at, at UC San Diego. And he has written widely on um, political economy and international relations and has been writing for a long time on East Asia and Korea and has uh, written on famine in North Korea. And then he wrote an interesting book on, um, where he did interviews with refugees from North Korea called Witness to Transformation and has a, as I mentioned before, has a blog on Witness to Transformation. And now he has a book coming out, uh, Engaging North Korea, but the, the title is Hard Target. Hard Target, colon, Engaging North Korea, which I think is an ingenious title. And um, I know we're, we've all been looking forward to your talk, and so welcome, Stefan. I'm going to try to do this in a way which is hopefully uh, doesn't strain your, your patience uh, uh, too much. Um, I, and I've actually made a lot of changes in what I was going to say over the course of the day because so much interesting has been said that's made me change somewhat my views on how I would present this material in front of this group. So you'll actually see references to some of yourselves in the slides, those of, uh, those of you who have presented. So uh, what I want to do is start with a, a question that comes out of other work I've been doing, which is the problem of authoritarian resilience. And um, to, to back up a little bit, you know, we had this third wave of democratization that begins in Southern Europe and it expands. And of course, the collapse of the Soviet Union plays a large role in increasing the number of democracies in the world. But recently, we've seen a slowdown in that process and a recognition that certain authoritarian regimes may actually have stability. They may be equilibrium, consolidated equilibrium forms of institutions that we have to understand on their own terms. They're not transitional to something else. And um, I, I just want to point out something which I think is obvious but hasn't gotten stated enough over the course of the af afternoon, which is that no regime is going to negotiate itself out of existence uh, except in extremists. And um, in that sense, I think that there really isn't a German model. There's a German model of reconciliation, but there's not a German model of unification um, because the unification of Germany was only, in my view, indirectly the result of Ostpolitik or any other external political economic process. It was rather a combination of economic weakness and ideological decay uh, incipient mobilization, actually, because the, the uh, Leipzig Ring Road played a very important role in showing the depth of opposition to the regime. But most obviously, um, it needs to be stated that it was, it was the exogenous collapse of the Soviet Union that ultimately resulted in unification. And so I think one of the first questions we have to ask ourselves if we're thinking about this process of, of reconciliation qua unification is whether North Korea is becoming a consolidated authoritarian regime. And my answer to that, uh, unfortunately, is increasingly yes. It probably is, though stuff happens, and it's very possible that the country could collapse in some form. But I've been an anti-collapsist for about 10 or 15 years now. And uh, so far, that position has actually managed to hold, because each succession, you know, when Kim Jong-un came to power, there was a revival of collapsist talk, and it, it hasn't proven true. So uh, let me actually start with the domestic politics, which I, did, which I didn't in, uh, intend initially to do. But um, you know, there are two basic routes through which regimes, uh, authoritarian regimes, can can uh, transition towards democratic rule. One is uh, challenges from below, and these challenges in North Korea are really extremely limited. It's uh, it's not a weak state. It's a poor country, but it's a very strong state. It has a very penetrating party apparatus that reaches down to the village level. Uh, there are no uh, independently organized groups as there were in the Philippines or Germany. There are no churches. There are no, there's no solidarity. There's no, you know, there's no civil society uh, that's independent of the state. 
Uh, that's on the negative side. And on the positive side, the regime has been actually very clever at focusing resources on the city of Pyongyang, creating what I call the Pyongyang illusion, which is a base of support in the city where life doesn't look so horrible. But you're 20 miles out of that, and you're, you know, you're in a low-income country. And, um, and, and Geibel you know, talked about um, uh, the surprising ideological coherence of the, uh, uh, of the regime, which I think also can't be taken for granted. No one believed in communism in East Germany in 1989. It had disappeared. No one took it seriously. That is not true in North Korea. It's just not true. And so um, that leaves us with this thin thread of whether the marketization of the economy, which is what I'm going to describe, is a, an unregulated space that provides the opportunity for civil society to emerge, which is at least possible, or whether, in fact, it's a source of economic growth which keeps people attached to the regime and actually mutes uh, or limits the, the prospect of, of regime transition. So if we look at challenges from below, I don't, see, I don't see a particularly helpful picture. This is the type of investment in Pyongyang you're seeing. I mean, this is a building in Pyongyang. Um, and then there's the question of challenges from above. And here, I, I understand the regime in part as a monarchy. It's a hereditary system. And monarchies have certain uh, advantages, which is basically the successor, the heir, solves transition challenges because he's a focal point. If anyone fights uh, to not accept the authority of the heir, then you have to figure out who among the, the barons, if you want to call that, are going to take power. And it's just not obvious who that would be. Uh, if you look at the Jiang Sung Tech indictment, he was accused of plotting a coup. And some have seen conflicts between the party and the military and the purges, which took place in the early part of the Kim Jong-un transition. And I'll talk about those. But, but I think that that's actually exactly what you would expect in a transition in a personalist regime, which is I purge my, the guys that my father put in place, and I bring in my own people. And so I don't think that's, a, that's necessarily a sign of instability at all. It could be a sign of stabilization. And I'll show some evidence to that effect. And if you look at the internal structure of the regime, it's, it's extremely interesting the way that multiple chains of command that end up in the hands of Kim Jong-il and Kim Jong-un and Kim Il-sung before him uh, permit a kind of authoritarian checks and balances which coup-proof the regime, that which, which make it less vulnerable to coups. And then finally, and this is something I'm actually going to emphasize more uh, throughout my talk, is there's a surprisingly favorable international environment, actually, for North Korea surviving. Um, we, don't think, we, we don't usually think in these terms, but there's, there's no safe haven for insurgents. There's no safe haven for dissidents. And you've got two patrons, in China in particular, Russia to a less extent, which are not going away. China's not going away. It's not going to go the route of the Soviet Union, or at least it's very unlikely. So that sort of exogenous shock, which would put the regime in trouble, is, is not on the horizon. In fact, those two regimes have been supportive because these authoritarian regimes are inc increasingly supporting one another. It's not only that the trend towards democracy has ceased, but that the authoritarian world is becoming more self-confident and is supporting itself. So uh, what I want to do is use some terminology which is a little bit different than that which we've used in the course of the conference over the day. I want to talk about the concept of engagement a little bit because the, the discussion of North-South relations and relations between North Korea and its other neighbors is, is typically talked about in terms of engagement rather than reconciliation. And then I want to show you some information on some of the economic components, some uh, information we've gathered from firm-level surveys of firms doing business in North Korea, talk about the international politics, and then talk about what's going on in North Korea itself, or at least as we can uh, glean it. So uh, basically, there, there are two fundamental models of engagement that are out there. And one I call, a, and others have called, a quid pro quo model. And a quid pro quo model of engagement is basically you're trying to change North Korean behavior, and it's centered primarily around the nuclear issue. And you do that primarily through extending various inducements. So we want the North Koreans to get rid of their nuclear weapons. We give them aid. We give them whatever. And um, there are some very classic sorts of problems with this uh, sort of strategy, like whether the inducements come before or after the, the actions, these questions of sequencing, and whether that can be coordinated and so forth. And I'll come back to some of that in looking at the six-party talks. 
But if you look at the logic of engagement as articulated by the um, South Korean left, and we talked about that this morning in Mr. Uh, Professor Kim's very interesting paper, a lot of it has to do with a deeper conception of how engagement on the part of the outside world will affect what you might think of as the target state, in this case, uh, North Korea. And if you recall, I mean, to me, the logic of, of Willy Brandt's Ostpolitik is not only one about politics, it's also about drawing uh, East Germany, and later Kissinger talked about the Soviet Union quite explicitly in this way, drawing them into webs of economic relationships with the, with the West, which would have moderating influences on their foreign policy behavior. And if you go back to the early debates about China, as well as all our discussions about Myanmar and Cuba and the sanctions and Iran, all of them replicate this question about whether engaging with these countries has positive effects or, or simply hands resources to the regime. And uh, to me, uh, in terms of just references, Edel Solingen's work is probably the most important that has, has uh, delved into these uh, kind of questions. So um, what is the logic of engagement? And by the way, I, I had this extraordinary opportunity um, before he died to interview Kim Dae-jung. We spent about an hour and a half together. And one of the things that really interested me is he, he saw the CSCE and the OSCE as quite explicit models in his head about uh, how things might happen. But um, his ideas are really classic 19th century liberal ideas, which is that uh, interdependence is good, it strengthens the private sector, it leads to marketization, it leads ultimately from there to reform, it constrains the foreign policy of the state, and then more fundamentally over time, it changes the coalitional foundation of the state. You get new actors who have uh, quite fundamentally different uh, interests. And so I think one of the questions that has plagued the debate about engagement or not engagement on the, on the Korean Peninsula, and this includes the United States as well, is the question of whether this is true or not. Because clearly the, the Kim Dae-jung no Mu Hyun years um, didn't have many successes, even though many of us were quite sympathetic with what the, those two administrations, and particularly Kim Dae-jung's. I think no Mu Hyun had a different approach to this question, but what those two administrations were trying to do. You know, is it true? So uh, the short answer, and it's a depressing answer, is I'm uncertain whether any external actions on the part of the outside, uh, whether in the form of sanctions or engagement, are, are necessarily efficacious. I think a lot hinges on what goes on in North Korea itself uh, as much as what we do outside trying to pull strings. So um, now I'm going to get to the sort of social science-y part of this a little bit. Um, and uh, give you a little tour de horizon of North Korea's economic relations. And I think there's no way to start talking about North Korea without beginning with the famine of the mid-90s, because this is, famines are just catastrophic events. And it had incredible impact. No one in the society was spared. I mean, up to and including the elite in Pyongyang itself. We know this from memoirs. And so, um, you know, there are a variety of estimates of North Korean uh, per capita income over time. As you can see, it's extraordinarily low, and this is something that people don't think about. PPP, it might be higher, of course, but, you know, it's basically this is a low-income country. And you see this steady growth, uh, though slow, through the 70s and 80s, and then with the collapse of the Soviet Union, the North Korean economy just implodes. Both the agricultural sector and the industrial sector basically unwind. And we can talk about why the agricultural sector was so severely affected, but it had to do with the reliance on inputs from the Soviet Union and uh, Russia. Uh, and China only very belatedly stepped into the breach to save North Korea, by the way, which it did in part. But basically, it was foreign aid that, that, uh, from the West that came to North Korea's assistance, and then you start to get this rebound finally. But one of the things that happens as a result of, that, of, that, of, the, of the famine is what Mark Noland and I call marketization from below, which is that households, in famine situations, households are basically, they're, they're looking for food. And looking for food, what they're doing is they're, they're engaging in any activity which will generate the cash or income for them to purchase food on the market. Because in a state socialist system with a, with a ration system, the famine is caused directly by the collapse of the, of the ration system. You go to the state store for your ration and it's closed. There's no food. 
And so you're forced out on your own to forage or do whatever you can to secure food. And one of the things that people did to secure food is they engaged in cash earning activities that would provide them the resources to purchase food on the market. And so this process of marketization ensued from below. This is not driven by policy from above. And this is a picture that's taken by a, a set of very interesting Japanese journalists from an organization called Rimjingang, where they, they basically sneak North Koreans back into North Korea and take pictures. And anyone who's traveled in South Korea at least 15 or 20 years ago would recognize a market like this on a weekend. You've got rice and so forth. But this is, this, is, um, you know, this is this process of marketization with respect to food, and this, this extends to a variety of other products, including um, the trade of cultural products, actually, across the Chinese-Korean uh, border. And you get this increase not only in domestic trade and households becoming involved in this kind of marketization activity, but you also get cross-border trade with, uh, with China in particular. So in witness to transformation, we did a, a, a number, we did these two surveys, one in China that we secured from a South Korean colleague and one that we replicated in Seoul. And we were just astonished by the share of income and the share of the refugee population that were involved in market-oriented activities. In fact, we found people who all of their income was coming from the market. And this is a state socialist system. But the important part for, of this for our purposes here, I think, um, it focuses more on the external side, which is that after this collapse in trade uh, during the first half of the 90s during the famine, you see this revival. And note that this revival of trade survives these various efforts to sanction North Korea multilaterally. So those sanctions don't seem to have any effect. And the simple point I want to convey, and the most important one, is that what's driving this upward swing in trade is basically trade with China. And uh, so this is, this is uh, the absolute uh, figures um, in millions of dollars, and this is the share of the five parties. And this is a little hard to see, because these, this isn't really done very well. I copied it from someplace else. So this is South Korea, and I'll actually take this apart a little bit more. But what you can see is, for all practical purposes, North Korea has become a, an appendage of the Chinese economy. And it's become an appendage of the Chinese economy partly because China is proximate and large and growing rapidly. But it's also because of these perverse effects of sanctions, which is you're pushing trade away from uh, countries like Japan which as recently as 2000 accounted for as much as North Korean trade as, as, as China did. And it's just basically fallen to nothing. The US was never anything. You know? so, so, and this is driven in part by mining investments, um, foreign direct investment by Chinese firms in mining. So there's this question of whether North Korea is becoming like a resource rentier state as well. You know, the trade follows this, these large-scale investments in um, extractive industries uh, such as coal. Now, I'm going to pause here a little bit on this slide because this gets very much to the political nature of outside relations on the north-south uh, side. Uh, this is sort of complicated because South Korean trade data, first of all, it doesn't treat trade with North Korea's foreign trade. It treats it as an internal trade. But it, it breaks up in a very interesting way, which I think useful to see. So um, these are just exports, South Korean exports to the North um, from 1989 to 2003. And of course, you know, this is the effect of, there's some under Kim Jong-sam, but you see the beginning of, of uh, the Kim, Kim Dae-jung and No moo hyun efforts, these increases in trade. Um, but what's interesting is that the biggest increase in trade during the engagement years is basically in the form of food and fertilizer. So this is aid. You know, South Korea is just putting aid into the North Korean economy. And the growth of commercial trade, which is what's called general trade or processing on commission trade, is also very small. And, um, and so a lot of the trade between North and South during the engagement years is not commercial trade. It's basically aid. And then uh, the Kaesong Industrial Complex kicks in around 2003, 2004, and that goes up very dramatically. But note the politicization of trade. This is the high point of the Nomo Hyun administration, the 2007 summit in, in Pyongyang. And then Lee Myung-bak comes to power, and all of the aid goes away. 
and you're, all you've got left is caisson, which is this enclave. So, um, uh, kind of counterintuitively, the Chinese are engaged in this commercial engagement with North Korea and seeing these very dramatic increase in shares of trade, and the South Koreans are engaged in aid followed by this enclave trade, which is concentrated in Kaesong. And so we have to ask ourselves, as I think critics of the Nomuhyun and, and Kim Dae Jung period did, is whether the type of engagement which was pursued either during the high engagement years or under the Kaesong model is one which is going to have this transformative effect. And I think the answer is sort of self-evident. You know, no, it, it doesn't seem to be that if there's transformation going on as a result of foreign trade, it's actually happening through the Chinese side which is interesting because then what type of model and so forth is being, is being uh, transmitted through these uh, mechanisms. Now, um, um, there, this raises a whole series of dilemmas for the, for the Park gun regime because as, as most of you know, those of you who study Korea, if, even if you don't, 2010 was an Anas Horribilis you had the sinking of the Chonan, you had the shelling of Yongpyong Island, you had the imposition of sanctions after the Chonan, which kept everything shut, including aid and commercial trade, except for Kaesong. Kaesong was all that was left. And so now the trust polity concept that Park geun is pursuing is attempting to synthesize the, the positive engagement of the Kim Dae-jung no Mo Hyun years with the conditional engagement of the Im Yong Bak years, and she's having a very, very difficult time because she's got established this presidential commission. They're trying to figure out where, what to do. Where do you make concessions? Do you lift sanctions? Do you lift the post Chonan sanctions? Do you engage in commercial things? Do you go into Rasan? What do you do that's going to provide you some sort of leverage? And uh, you might have seen recently the Presidential Commission is now considering how do we get humanitarian assistance going. But again, all of these questions raise to what end? You know, if the North Koreans aren't interested in talking on anything that's of significance to you other than family reunions. And so uh, I think, you know, trust politique is really struggling. It's struggled since she's come to office. How do you generate meaningful engagement that you think is going to have some positive effect either on the economy long run or on the type of things that you're interested in quid pro quo. And it's very difficult given where North Korea is, which I'll, I'll come back to. Um, let me just say one thing very briefly about, about the, the sort of micro level. Um, we did surveys of firms doing business in North Korea, both South Korean firms and Chinese firms. And this just gives you some sense of the types of activities they're involved in, exporting, importing, investing, and so forth. But one thing that comes out of these surveys very clearly is that for anything that's generating foreign exchange for the North Koreans, the government is controlling it. So we think of trade as commercial trade, even the China trade, but of course it's not commercial on the North Korean side because all the entities that are engaged in this trade are, are state-owned enterprises. And so again, you know, this is, these are the sort of doubts about this engagement model. I mean, sanctions obviously didn't work, and I'll explain that in a minute, but this engagement process has really not had exactly the effect that we anticipated either. Okay, so uh, let me skip ahead to um, the international politics of this, because this gets more to the question of whether there should be engagement not through economic or social channels. Fania raised the issue of what about social exchanges? That's actually part of the agenda. Should we let NGOs go in? Should we let civil society groups go? And of course, when this last agreement was reached at the time of the mine incident, which led to this North-South agreement, the South Koreans wanted to include and did include in there, we want to see NGOs go in, which I think is a very clever thing to do. But the only thing that's happened so far is you've had the family reunions. And again, you're seeing the subtext here is that many of the things that we think would be positive for advancing the course of engagement with North Korea, it's not clear the North Koreans are interested in them for fairly obvious reasons. So let's just go to the politics briefly and then I wanna say something about North Korea itself. Um, so the mechanism for engaging North Korea at the multilateral level has been this ad hoc body called the Six-Party Talks, which was formed after the Bush administration bungled 
the discovery of information having to do with North Korea's centrifuge program. They cut off oil shipments under the agreed framework, which had been what had kept uh, uh, Young Beyond closed ever since the first nuclear crisis. Um, but the Bush administration came to its senses during its second term when uh, Condoleezza Rice was secretary and engaged in a set of negotiations that led to what is a, a, an extremely important statement of principles, an agreement in principle, which is uh, known as the joint statement of September 2005 or the statement of principles of, of 2005. And the core of the joint statement is very simple. It, it outlines a grand bargain, which everyone knows is the bargain which is a potential end state. Not an end state of unification, but an end state of detente, which is that North Korea gives up its nuclear weapons, the United States moves towards normalization, and the international community provides assistance to North Korea to get it on uh, a track which will be uh, a track of reform. And uh, part of that process would be to negotiate away the armistice, uh, put the armistice behind it, and replace it with a, a peace regime on the peninsula. And I made comments on this uh, before. But um, the problem is that the six-party talks broke down in 2008. And, and that's a, I, I'll leave the history of this aside, but people who watch this closely, we sit around and we debate what happened in 2008. But the point is the talks broke down and frankly, there really doesn't seem much interest on the part of the North Koreans in reviving them. Uh, they tested in 2006. Obama comes to office. They test within three months of him coming to office after he's signaled his willingness to engage the country more generally as he signaled his willingness to engage Iran and Cuba and, and, and Burma. And, and you know, this just left the administration with very difficult choices. What, what do you do when you come in saying that in principle you're interested in returning to these talks and the response of the North Korean regime is to test? It just puts, just for political purposes with a democratic president, it makes it extremely difficult for him to um, move away. There was another run in 2012, the so-called leap year deal, which also breaks down over a missile test. And then most significantly, and this is the sad, most sad significant fact, in the, after the events of the spring of 2013, which are very tense on the peninsula, um, the US was doing mock B-2 bomb runs over the country. You know, this was a time of a tremendous rhetorical strain. The, um, the party rolls out this new po strategic policy called the Byungjin Line, and the core of the Byungjin Line is the stated goal, the stated goal of maintaining the nuclear weapons program and pursuing economic development. And um, it's just, you know, extremely difficult for a U.S. president to sit down and negotiate a peace regime or take any initiative in the context of which North Korea has basically said we're keeping our nuclear weapons. And people who are on the, 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 the left, both in the United States and, and who are interested in engagement, myself included, have long wanted to believe that that's just the rhetoric of the North Korean regime. There's a, there's a strike price in which you can get them to give up the nuclear weapons. But there's just decreasing evidence that that's the case. There just doesn't seem to me much interest. And the Chinese haven't been willing to push them to the extent to get them to the table to actually engage in serious negotiations. And I think it's time we take the North Koreans seriously. They want to keep their nuclear weapons, and they're going to keep them, uh, unless something very unusual happens. And we know that unusual things happen. The Soviet Union collapsed. So it's possible that China could decide they're going to put pressure, but it doesn't look like that's the way they conduct their foreign policy. OK, so uh, let me just say something about the politics and economic reform, and then I'll stop. I'm, I'm sounding particularly depressing tonight, I have to say, even to myself. Um, so uh, um, one of the things we've done, uh, as you probably gathered, one of the things I've done with respect to this North Korea work is to try to bring unusual types of data or sort of collect data on North Korea, which uh, you know, is, is considered a black hole, and it is, but there are ways you can get information out. And so one of the things we did was we tracked the membership in these core institutions, the Secretariat, the National Defense Commission, the Politburo over time. And again, there's a very bad slide because you can't see the white bars, but it's relatively small. The Politburo is relatively small. But one of the things you see is all of these institutions are shrinking, and they're shrinking because they're getting older. 
This is a gerontocracy in two, until 2008. At one point, the Politburo Standing Committee, which is the equivalent of the, of the it, you know, has its Chinese equivalent, which is the main governing body of the Chinese Communist Party, um, the Politburo Standing Committee, had one member, Kim Jong-il. So this is not a deliberative, deliberative body, obviously. You know, these are sort of fake institutions. But then you see after 2008, 2009, you know, this effort to set in place a succession system that would support Kim Jong-un's uh, taking of power. But one of the things that's extremely depressing about this process is that the people who are moving into these institutions uh, at the margin, at the margin, tended to be from the military. And so quite naturally, during a succession period, Kim Jong-un is pulling in the security apparatus. Kim Jong-il, before he dies, and Kim Jong-un are pulling in the security apparatus in the military because those are the core actors that you have to mollify in order to make this transition process. And so you're seeing a tremendous amount of churning in the leadership, but you're not getting new types of people. You're purging a military guy and you're replacing him with a military guy and you're bringing net new military people into the regime. So during this first several years, it's really hard to say that this isn't you know, some kind of military regime. You know, it's like a military regime. And obviously the priorities of military regimes that are authoritarian are to spend money on themselves. Um, and, and that's an established cross-national political science finding. You know, military governments spend more on the military than non-military governments, and certainly more than uh, democracies on average. Um, so, uh, you know, I've talked about the, the purges. Um, this is the funeral beer. Um, and, and it's, you know, this, is, this goes to your, your paper about, you know, the way that stylized things are used to propagate, you know, images of the regime. And, you know, here's the civilian side, and there's Jiang Sung Tech, and here's this, you know, Kim Jong-un on the right, and then on the, the other side you have the military. These are the two, so the party and the military. All of the people who are in this picture, eight of them, they're all gone, right? They're gone. They're not, they're not pur purged, killed. Jiang Sung Tech was killed. Several of them we don't know, but all of them are out, you know? So this is very much him bringing new people in, and I don't see any reason to think that this regime isn't internally consolidated. I could be wrong tomorrow, we hope, but um, there's no evidence that he hasn't managed to consolidate power. And that re leads us to the last thing I'm going to talk about very briefly, and I'll stop, which is uh, whether there are signs of reform in North Korea. And um, I don't know if anyone knows who this is on the left-hand picture. This is Eric Schmidt, who's the chief, chief executive officer, the CEO of Google. And he actually visited North Korea, and he's looking at computers, and he's standing in a coat because the buildings aren't heated. And, and so on, and this is um, Richards, Richardson, um, Bill Richardson. And then uh, he, they, he, they refused, Kim Jong-un refused to meet with Eric Schmidt. Now, it wasn't because at that moment he was hanging out with Dennis Rodman, but, but that was, you know, there's something revealing here. There's something that's just, you know, and I know people who were on this trip who talked about this, and I'm telling you, the stories are just, you know, are, are really depressing. I mean, it's almost like this is a country which is run in part by someone who's, um, you know, is behaving like the Seth Rogen movie, and um, to a greater extent than people might believe, and it's, it's just really extraordinary. I mean, here's this opportunity that's passed up. Now, now, that's, this is partly, I usually don't like to do this, but you get impatient when you study North Korea. But, but more seriously, I do think there were some efforts at economic reform in the early Kim Jong-un era, and uh, that there were some attempts. And we can talk about the specifics of these. I don't want to go in. It's late in the day. But they had to do with some modest reforms in agriculture, with respect to the management system, with respect to foreign direct investment, with respect to the cabinet, the responsibility of the cabinet. Um, and this was really a reversal of what had happened um, during the 2005-2009 period when, when there was a, a reversal of an earlier reform uh, that ended in this disastrous currency conversion. And again, uh, it's late in the day to absorb data, but, but um, prices, you know, this is this currency conversion where basically all North Koreans are required to take the existing currency they have and turn it in. And this is really basically an assault on market traders because the people who are holding large cash balances are households that are involved in this business activity. And there's a limit to how much you can convert. 
And what this does is it sets in train this process of inertial inflation over the next three years, which is about 100% a year probably. And obviously, if you're trying to do reform in that kind of circumstances, you're really up against you know, very, very serious constraints. Um, so um, as you can see, prices of both rice and the US dollar have stabilized and have even come down maybe a little bit. And I think that what's going on now is a process that might be called not marketization from below, but reform from below, where the government isn't undertaking overt initiatives to reform the economy, but what it's doing is it's acquiescing in people making money, including this new class, the Dongju class, which are basically princelings and rich North Koreans who have resources, and who have resources not only to be involved in petty ventures, but have resources to be involved in things like wholesale activities and even housing. And there are people buying apartments in North Korea for fifty, seventy-five, a hundred thousand dollars. This is not the Korea of old. There's a country that's got a per capita income of several thousand dollars. It's a poor country, but there are people in it that are rich, and they live in Pyongyang, and they have connections with the regime, and they're corrupt. But so what? This is consolidating a regime which is actually functioning. You know, it's a functioning regime. And you know, you know, you've all seen these uh, sort of pictures you know, of the emergence of small-scale market activity and these kinds of things. So uh, I don't know if I have any clear conclusions, but I, I think that you know, there's just extraordinary difficulty on the part of the United States, partly for political reasons in South Korea, to take any actions that will get them leverage over the core things that are of interest to them, um, given where North Korea is at this particular moment. And so I think that uh, one of the things that Kim, Kim Dae-jung said to me, which I thought was extremely interesting, he said, you know, it's hard to conduct a long game foreign policy in a democracy because people will criticize you that it isn't working in the short run. And I think that in some ways the Chinese are probably playing a very long game in which they, they think that this could take a decade, this could take 15 years. They're going to try to restrain the North Koreans from testing. You know, they'll try to keep the nuclear program from growing, but they're going to continue to engage North Korea. And I think the long hope is that that will ultimately you know, shift the regime in a direction which would be more reform oriented and would provide the opportunity for pursuing a resumption of the six party talk negotiations or a more robust north south relationship. But right now, I don't think most people think that we're anywhere, frankly, in terms of moving this uh, relationship along. Okay, I've talked for more than 30 minutes, so I think I'll stop and we can take some questions if people want. Sure. I mean, I know it's getting late, so people may want to go, but I'm happy to stay as long as people want to uh, to, uh, to ask questions. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I should leave this last slide up. It is really interesting to know more about the Chinese culture from North Korea. But I'm still interested in the uh, Pyongyang-Beijing relationship. Yeah. It seems to me that it's kind of extortion from Pyongyang to Beijing. Uh, I don't know what, what happened actually. For instance, Kim Dae-jung uh, didn't participate to the 3rd of the September military parade. The Kim, Kim Jong-un, yeah. Yeah. And uh, when President Xi Jinping visited South Korea, uh, he didn't. Um, it is uh, exceptional for, for the uh, Chinese and the North Korean uh, relationship. Mostly, they will, I mean, the new, when, when a new leadership uh, coming up, they will pay vis first visit to North Korea and then South Korea. But this time is different. Right. So uh, what's your take? What's your reading of this? Well, uh, I, you I don't know. know. I, I don't mean, know. Yeah, please. Yeah. So um, I think it's, it's an open secret, and anyone in Beijing will tell you who works on North Korea that the, that the Chinese are not particularly pleased with the way the regime has evolved over the last five or six years. 
I, I mean, they were not happy about, they didn't say it, but they, didn't, they weren't happy about the Chonan, they weren't happy about Yongpyeongdo, they weren't happy about the 2009 test, they weren't happy about the 2013 test, and both of those, by the way, were both long-run missile tests and nuclear tests. So declaratory Chinese policy has always been completely unambiguous on the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. It's not ambiguous. China supports the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. The question is what they're willing to do about it. And their conception of doing something about it is convening the six-party talks, which requires the United States to jump back in and say, okay, we're willing to talk. And the United States is not willing to do that because they don't believe that there's any sense in holding negotiations over something which don't, aren't going to address the fundamental issue of interest to the United States. And so China is actually, I, I'm actually quite sympathetic on this issue with China. I mean, first of all, North Korea sits on the Chinese border. So I live in San Diego. Think you're sitting, you know, in Yanji or wherever it is on the Chinese side and North Korea is five, you know, 15 minutes away. And so there's a concern about the meltdown of the country. There's a concern about refugees. There's a concern about the ethnic composition of the, of the provinces in Northeast China where there are significant Korean minorities, even though I don't think there's any reason to worry about that. But you know, you fly into Yanji, it's Hangul. You know, it's Korean, that's what you see. You know? And so there's concerns about that. Um, but I do think that, and, and there was money pumped in to North Korea at the time of the transition. But I don't think the Chinese are propping up the regime by aid. I think they're willing to say to Chinese firms, if you can make money in North Korea, go make money in North Korea, but we're not going to, you know, we're not going to subsidize you. We're not going to subsidize that effort. So um, I, I think, I, I really do think that, um, and the Chinese won't say this openly, I think they're playing a very long game with North Korea. What they're hoping is that North Korea will go the Chinese route. You know, and, and for the United States and for South Korea, that would be great, but there's this complication of the nuclear issue because it's, again, I said it's very difficult politically for the United States to negotiate unless there's some glimmer of hope and some signal that they'd be willing to return to their responsibilities under the Non-Proliferation Treaty. And so that's, that's, that's really a barrier for the U.S. It's very hard to sit down unless there's some hope that that's going to happen. So the Chinese, they still provide North Koreans with huge amount of food and, and no. energy. No, 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 that's, no, I mean, it's very important you understand what I'm saying. They do that commercially, commercially. So in other words, they're, they're exporting coal and marine products and whatever North Korea can export to finance the, the you know, the imports which, which, which North Korea is, is, is receiving. This is not an aid relationship. I mean, there was aid funneled in at the time of the transition to support the transition, and China just rallied to Kim Jong-un, and these over-the-top expressions of support for the new leadership and the party and all of that. But, but the, the, the long-run relationship, as far as we can tell, is that the current account deficit that North Korea has, which is non-trivial, is financed by investment by Chinese firms. It's not financed by aid from, the, from Beijing. So the, all of that commercial activity you're seeing on the Chinese side is commercial activity. It's commercial it's activity. For, for well, they could cut it off, they right? They could cut it off, right? right? But one of the things they've always said is, in terms of the sanctions, they are not going to go after commercial trade. I mean, they've basically tried to sanction Korea only with respect to uh, dual-use technologies and those things which are feeding into the WMD programs. And all the multilateral sanctions, by the way, none of them talk about, about commercial trade. Yeah. Uh, so my question is about engagement. Yeah. Um, and you asked the question of what can we, what kind of action can be taken that they would actually be interested in? Because right. obviously the nuclear one isn't um, at this moment. Um, so then I'm thinking, okay, can we learn something from the Norwegians who just produced this very grand rock concert this summer called Leibach. I don't know if you followed that news at all. Oh, we, we covered it in detail. Uh, oh, you, you do? Have to, you have to read our blog. At okay, Leibach, we have Leibach post after Leibach post. Right, which was a huge deal, and there was a huge crowd, and they were successful right. to a large extent. Um, and, then I, and then I think of Pust, which is this um, university run by Christian missionaries, right? Yeah. Pyongyang University of Science and Technology. And yeah. they've been around since... I don't know, I want to say like 2010, maybe 2009, earlier. Yeah. Um, 
And they seem to be pretty successful and resilient in terms of the kind of engagement they put forward. Um, so that tells me that, okay, North Koreans are interested in science and technology. Right. And rock music. And um, basketball. I'm for it. And I'm sure there's more. Do it. Um, I, and, I, I'm, and I'm I just all feel for like it. Not, I, I have no problem with any of those activities. I think we should be doing more of them. It goes back to Fanya's right. fun, question. I mean, no, I, I, I think it's silly for us to prevent those kinds of things from happening. But I also think it's extremely important to understand the limits of what these type of things achieve. You send the New York Philharmonic to, to, to Pyongyang, fine. If some rich donors want to you know, spend $10 million to spend the New York Philharmonic to Pyongyang, I don't think that they should be prohibited from doing so. But the question is whether that translates into a discussion, a negotiation, a back channel, you know, some sort of game with respect to the political issues that are on the table. I don't see any evidence for that. So I, I just think we have to be honest about separating these things. You know, all good things don't necessarily go together. Poost is fine. You know, basketball is fine. Do it. I think we should be doing it. But again, this is a long game, right? This is not affecting things which are politically salient for either South Korea or the United States or Japan for that matter, or even China, right? So you have to have the patience if you go that route to say, we're gonna just continue to do this in the hope that you know, this will change. I'll take you two guys. Let's go ahead, fine. Okay, so uh, I, I can scream. You don't have to rush with the mic. Sure. Um, <laughs> it's more for recording purposes. First of all, just very quickly, I totally agree with you about uh, the limits of social engagement, people to people. We ought not to be starry-eyed about it. Simply to add it to our explicatory mechanisms. Sure not to disregard it. So I have a totally different question. Uh, I'll try to be brief about it. I want to raise the... You don't have to be brief, Fanya. Everything you say is interesting, so <laughs> take as long as you want. <laughs> I have to be brief because I'm falling asleep. It's four in the morning okay. for me. Well, that's a good, that, that's a good reason <laughs> to, to be brief. To finish my question... <laughs> don't be brief on my account, is all I'm saying. <laughs> I want to raise the good old rationality question. Yeah which back home in Israel we call, um, after speaking of rock, you know, Sting had this wonderful line in the 80s, I hope the Russians love their children too. Right. So we call it the Russians love their children too paradigm. Right. Sure. That is, you know, it, it, they began, I think it was, they, they began to discuss it in the 70s apropos Gaddafi's regime in Libya at its height. Is Gaddafi rational or can he blow everybody up? And with nuclear powers, it becomes more interesting. And so far, there has been a sense that there is rationality out there. Iran, that's been you know, on the table quite recently. North Korea, certainly the Russians, back when they were the, Soviet, the nuclear Soviet Union. And now we have the big question whether ISIS, if they lay their hands on a nuclear instrument, whether they're going to be similarly Russian. Do they love their children too? Or is their concept of heaven so promising that they are genuinely happy to send their kids up there like some other Islamist extremists? Right. So I simply want to ask whether you think that the rationality question is A, relevant, and B, interesting to the North Korean situation today. Yeah, I'm going to give you a super nerdy social science answer to this question, which is, is uh, I think that rationality is an assumption that social scientists make in order to explain the world. And so if you're telling me that someone is irrational, that means their behavior is random. And if their behavior is random, there's no possible way I can understand and explain it. I might as well just flip a coin. So um, we impute rationality. Um, because it, it's a way of making sense of how actors behave. Now, the question is, rational with respect to what set of goals or preferences or ends? I mean, just having rationality doesn't tell you how someone's going to behave. You have to know what their preferences are. And uh, I, I, so the short answer to your question is, I think it makes no sense to say that Qaddafi is irrational. I mean, there's a guy who rose to the leadership of a, of a small country. He's not stupid. And Kim Jong-un and his cohort are not stupid. I mean, they're capable of ruling this place, which is extraordinarily complicated and Byzantine. It's court politics. So uh, you know, I, I never underestimate someone's capabilities, uh, including their capacity to make decisions based on some cost-effect calculus. But what's hard to stipulate 
is what are the costs, how do they see the costs and benefits of particular lines of action? So for example, keeping nuclear weapons is probably, I can't demonstrate this, connected very much to things you talked about, about domestic legitimation strategies. It may have nothing to do, I mean, it has a deterrent effect on the United States, but these weapons aren't really usable, but they have tremendous domestic political use because we're a nuclear power. We just launched a satellite. And if you see the billboards in, in North Korea, they're plastered with this following the launches, right? This is a great accomplishment of the nation. And so, you know, is that irrational? Obviously not. It's just that the rationale is a political rationale. And if you don't take that into account, then you can't understand what they're doing. You know? Bev, you had, and I'll come back to you. Yeah. yeah. I have a question about, I mean, a couple of light motifs in this conference. And one is kind of the civic engagement and rock concerts and things. And, um, and another one is the process versus the end game. So, which you brought up, what is the end game of all of it? What, what would you like to see happen? I mean, what do you think is reasonably, what can one reasonably expect if one wants to engage North Korea? I mean, you seem to have thrown up your hands and said, I don't know what's, nothing seems to work. But what, what would constitute working? I mean, should they get rid of their nuclear weapons? Should yeah. they become a democracy? Should they... Open? No, let me, let me be clear about what I mean by nothing works. What I mean is that, that um, North Korea is at a certain place in its developmental trajectory, however we define what that is. And my only point is the extent to which either sanctions or engagement with this country fiddling with small amounts of money at the margin is going to affect the fundamental trajectory of where they're going. It doesn't make sense to me, right? I mean, take the sanctions thing. This is a regime which survived the death of 600,000 to a million people. You think tweaking a couple $10 million of sanctions is going to affect their, them? I mean, you know, sanctions it's ridiculous. What are sanctions supposed to be doing? You know, I mean, well, they're, well, we're only sanctioning, we're only stopping military equipment and luxury goods. It it's, seems it's, like it's not going to have the effect because the Chinese will never go any deeper than that. The objective is to get them to the table to negotiate the, their nuclear weapons program. I mean, the objective from the perspective of the United States is pretty clear. I mean, that's... That's it, basically. Well, it's, it's, it, it's it because we're sort of politically stuck, um, and this gets into a, just a big issue about whether we should care about whether North Korea has nuclear weapons. But I can tell you about whatever your position on that, like it doesn't matter. Do I think it affects the stability of the, of the Korean Peninsula from a strategic standpoint? Do I think it affects extended deterrence? No, I don't think it, we're perfectly capable of deterring a bolt from the blue, a conventional attack. I, it doesn't worry me, it doesn't keep me up at night that North, North Korea has nuclear weapons, it really doesn't. No president of the United States can say, I don't care about North Korea's nuclear weapons. It's not gonna happen, you'd get massacred. And so you, you basically pursue a policy of strategic patience saying, we're gonna ratchet up sanctions, we're leaving the door open to talks, you know, we hope that you know, they undertake reform, we're gonna coordinate with our allies. I mean, I get a, a Google six-party talk alert into my inbox, I get a message on this thing every day. You know, China says we should resume the, the six-party talks. But the point is, no one really believes it. And it's just important to understand that. No one really believes that that's gonna happen, right? So you're asking me what we want. We want this process, which is, I think, starting to unfold in North Korea, to gather steam, you know? To, for North Korea to go in a Chinese direction and see, oh, I can survive the market. Because we, have, and we do have ample evidence that we documented in Famine in North Korea and since and some monographs that the, the, the regime is very unsettled by market-oriented reforms, partly because they haven't had the intended effect, partly because they had unintended consequences, but partly for political reasons. And the Chinese Communist Party learned that it's perfectly capable of maintaining power while letting the market rip. The North Koreans haven't learned that. So if they do, you know, maybe you'd be in a place where you could say, well, now you can see that you know, maybe some investment from the Europeans, forget the United States, forget Japan, would be a desirable thing for you to have. And you know, that's affected by nuclear weapons too. You, know, you might want to think about that. right? But right now, that doesn't seem to be where they are. Now, 
Could it be that they, they get so far in their possession of their nuclear program that it becomes very difficult or impossible to roll back? Can't rule it out. And then it just becomes like uh, a cancer that kills you in 20 years, right? It just sits there and everyone says the same thing, but you sort of tolerate it. Okay, I think yeah. you should take one more question yeah. Yeah, and then ahead. we'll have to yeah, adjourn. Yeah, it's, it's getting late. Well, I almost don't want to ask my question now because that was such a great response to a kind of capstone question. But I want to bring it back to uh, your initial thoughts about uh, Germany uh -huh. one more time. Sure. Um, I would agree 100% that there's no such thing as a German model because there never is a model of anything. But I think what there might be are some lessons or if that's too didactic, let's say some takeaways from right. what happened with East Germany and stuff like that. The first thing is I'm not sure that I agree 100% that no one believed in communism in the GDR in 1989. I think very few people lived in, believed in real existing socialism, but there certainly were many true believers and the 20 to 25% of the population that's continued to vote for the reformed communist party, oh sorry, the left party now, um, shows that these ideals weren't dead. So, I mean, I would just uh, mention yeah. that. But, you know, what I think is interesting, and, and when I was listening to your, um, your talk, I saw all sorts of parallels with the East German case. So, for instance, a lot of people have talked about how, you know, West German television having made it across the border is one of the things that innerly democratized or at least prepared East Germans for, you know, the, the new regime when it came. And, you know, your pictures of cell phones and you mentioned how there's all sorts of informational flows that are going into North Korea now. I see that as a major parallel. The second thing is, back in the 80s, everybody lamented the state of civil society in East Germany, especially compared to Poland or the Czech Republic or, you know, even the Soviet Union in some respects. And so I'm not sure that East Germany had a particularly robust civil society, and in fact, the churches were, you know, not these heroic actors as they were in Poland or anything like that, but they were there to be mobilized at the right time and everything like that. Anyway, the only point that I was trying to make is that I see a few more parallels than perhaps mm -hmm. you, uh, you mentioned. Um, the differences are also, of course, interesting as well. I think that your insight into the monarchical um, dynamics within North Korea is, uh, you know, really, you know, quite right on. Um, and then also, uh, the, the final point I guess I would make is that the big thing in East Germany is that you had, you had a bankrupted model, right? The Soviet Union was starting to collapse, and one might argue that the collapse of East Germany was one of the things that led to the Soviet Union to collapse later on. But, you know, you had a bankrupt model, and then you had a very strong model, which was West Germany, the West, and everything like that. What's interesting in the North Korean case today is that there are now multiple models with China perhaps being an even more attractive mm -hmm. alternative than uh, the West. Oh, so, yeah. I don't know. I've, no, all the things you've said are very cogent. I, I, I was just in Berlin over the summer and was meeting with some scholars who work on East Germany, and I, they had some extremely interesting data that the Stasi itself was collecting. And, and it's surprising about how they were aware of the depth of the cynicism in the public about the party. So I, I don't know. Yeah, there were true believers, but that's after the party had these parties had disbanded and so forth. But, but uh, just a couple things uh, to be clear. So there are certainly these cultural products which are moving um, through the market. You can get executed for having them if the regime chooses to do so. They don't necessarily. Um, there's no penetration of, uh, of television signal from, from the South. It's all jammed. So what, the estimate in 1989 was what, 70% of East Germans could see West German television. There's nothing like that. I mean, you're really talking about much more of a parallel universe. Now, that's eroding, but it's eroding in Pyongyang, right? It's eroding among the elite. And, um, and so I guess what I, I see is a, is a regime which is capable of placating a Pyongyang-based elite by giving it taste, the capacity to travel, the ability to use a cell phone, income, but coupled with a very, a much more powerful ideological narrative, which is, a, is, is more appealing than we think. Now, when we surveyed refugees, they were, they were incredibly cynical. But on that particular question, you really have selection issues, right? Because they're leaving, so you know that they're disaffected. But can we project that onto the rest of the population? It's not clear to me. And um, even for the population which is really disadvantaged and struggling, uh, that, isn't, that isn't the group that revolts. I mean, revolts don't come from those who are really cash constrained. That's not where they come from. They come from intellectuals. They come from people who have, who have resources that they can um, expend on, on the process of mobilization and moving out of the workforce to do political activity. So, so um, 
again, um, I, I don't see the from below type of activity, which was really central to the East German transition in the end, because in the end, I mean, people just walked away from that system in a, in a heartbeat, you know, and could that happen in North Korea? I mean, the Stasi had absolutely nothing on the internal security apparatus in North Korea. I mean, it's, 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 it's more penetrating than the Stasi. It really is. And, and much more oppressive, you know, brutal. Um, but we can talk about that over a beer. It sounds like people are, it's time to have that drink. So thanks very much, everyone, for coming. I really appreciate it.